working. Hello. Jananam Sukadham Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalevesha Sakalam Karunam Samaya Depate Akilam Karunam. Good afternoon, everybody, Excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. <coughs> Good afternoon, Sadhguru. And good afternoon to your excellencies and distinguished guests and to uh, all the meditators who are watching on the internet right now. Um, I'm so grateful to be here and, uh, and it's such a privilege really to be here. My name is Maxwell Kennedy and um, I've been, I learned how to meditate from Sadhguru a few years ago. And um, so we're here at the United Nations and there are four, maybe 40 or 60 ambassadors here in 70 different countries and 7,000 people, and we're here to talk about sustainable development. So why did you start with a chant? <laughs> the chant is uh, an invocation. An invocation means uh, to perform different types of activities. We need to have our energies in different ways. Otherwise, most people have become competent in one way or the other. But if you ask them to do something totally different, they will find themselves totally at loss. This is simply because their energies get directed in one way only. An invocation means you kind of make yourself malleable in such a way that for every different type of action, you need your energies in different parts of your system and you are able to graduate that, calibrate that in such a way to perform that specific activity. So when I sit here, what we need to do is different from what I was doing when I was walking down here. So this is just calibration using sounds. If we have to know the meaning, it's uh, talking about how birth is sweetness but death is compassion, it's a relief. We may think death is a terrible thing, but uh, aren't we glad that someday we will die? Suppose we could not die, that would be terrible, isn't it <laughs> Suppose we can't die at all. And uh, above all, it is talking about yoga in the sense, the chant is describing yoga as a way of transcending time. When we say transcending time, Right now, we have a sense of time only because we are so identified with our physical nature. Suppose we did not have a body, we would, ha would not have any sense of time. Our body is keeping time. Everything that is time is cyclical, but yoga is a dimension which wants to transcend, which helps you to transcend these cycles and make a journey beyond cyclical nature of life, which is the nature of physical existence. Thank you. Um, I had a teacher at Harvard who was a medical doctor and he told me a story that uh, when he was a young doctor he went down to Mississippi and he saw children there in the United States, this is in the uh, mid-1960s, who were starving. And um, after that trip he went to Washington, D.C. and he, had, uh, he tried to meet a group of senators and he went to one after the other and none of them would talk to him. And on Sunday afternoon, he got my father's phone number at home. My father is Senator Robert F. Kennedy. And my sister, Kerry, who runs the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial, is here right now, and my wife, Vicki. So, but he got my dad's number, and he called, and, uh, and it was Sunday. My dad's with the children, and, and, and he said to him, uh, well, all right, why don't you come over and we'll talk. And um, after they spoke, my dad went to Mississippi. 
where this uh, doctor had gone, and when he came back, he wrote this, uh, he, he said these words, um, and there are others on the back roads of Mississippi where thousands of children slowly starve their lives away, their minds damaged beyond repair by the age of four or five, in the camps of the migrant workers, a half million nomads, virtually unprotected by collective bargaining or social security, minimum wage or workman's compensation, exposed to the caprice of fate and the cruelty of their fellow man alike, and on Indian reservations where the unemployment rate is 80 percent and where suicide is not a philosopher's question, but the leading cause of death among young people. So after that trip, my uh, father went back to the Senate and he worked with a group of others and they, uh, they created the first food stamps program in the United States. And that is kind of the development model that I'm used to. So when I look at the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, my immediate reaction is to think, are the Addis Ababa Accords going to fund this or not? But you have a different approach. Can you talk about yoga in that context? So when we say sustainable development goals, we are talking about human well-being, addressing human well-being as seventeen different issues which concerns poverty, nourishment, health, women's issues, environment, this kind of things. Essentially, we are talking about human well-being. How can you transform the world without transforming individual human beings? This is the effort that's going on in the world for a long time. We want to transform the world, but we are not aiming at individual human beings. The world is just a word, it is just you and me. If there is no transformation in you and me, if there is no change in the way we perceive, experience and fe think, feel and act in this world, how can you change the world? So we can pump in money, we can have projects, they will all go up and go down. But only if we transform individual human beings on a large scale, only then there will be true transformation. This is why yoga becomes a significant thing. Today, the United Nations taking this… Uh, taking up this International Yoga Day is a very important step. I would say it's a revolutionary approach because without transforming individual human beings, you cannot really transform the world because there is no such thing as in reality. In reality, there's just you, me and someone else. If all of us change, the world has changed. If we refuse to change, we will be only talking about it. I've been to any number of international peace conferences and everybody is talking about world peace. In one of these conferences where there were seventeen uh, Nobel laureates, I asked them a simple question. Is it is it true that all of you are truly peaceful human beings? Can you put your hand on your heart and say, I am peaceful? They admitted, no Sadhguru, we don't know how to be peaceful, but we want the world peaceful. How is that possible? What… what you see as the world is just a larger manifestation of who we are. Sadhguru, the um, you know, I, I, there were thousands of people doing doing yoga in um, doing yoga in Times Square for International Yoga Day, and you can see all around the world in Brazil, in the United States, in L.A. where I live, people are doing yoga. And when we're doing it, we're I'm stretching out my body and <laughs> trying to control my breathing. Can can you explain what yoga really is and how that can help attain the SDGs? So this fundamental human longing for health, for well-being, for fulfillment of life, when you find a logically correct and scientifically ascertainable way, then we say this is yoga. Yoga means in search, in pursuit of human well-being, we've been doing all kinds of things. We've been looking up for a long time, which has led to humanity being divided in the name of religions, castes, creeds in so many different ways. Now in the last fifty years, I would say we are looking out seriously and we are ripping the planet apart. All the environmental degradation that we are talking about is just in pursuit of human well-being. In the last hundred years, 
definitely we are the most comfortable generation ever. But we cannot say we are well because <laughs> we are not really well. People are not happy, people are not peaceful. That is not happening because we have not addressed the inner nature. So when it… when you address it in a scientific manner, rather than by belief, by philosophy, by ideologies, you address human well-being in a scientific way, this is yoga. And yoga is a way of… the word yoga literally means union. When we say union, what we're talking about is, we're talking about a scientific way of obliterating your… the boundaries of your individuality. When I say a scientific way of obliterating, the boundaries of your individual nature, what this means is, right now as we sit here, this is me, that is you, distinctly clear. But we are breathing the same air, we are… we are a product of the same earth. What you call as myself is just a pop-up on this planet and it'll pop out. But in this little bit of time, we have divided this in such a way that we can't meet. Yoga means you obliterate these individual boundaries not intellectually, not by belief, not by ideology, but as a living experience. We… L we launched a… I mean, this was there on the video. We launched a very large-scale environmental project in southern India. The fundamental for this came from this. This happened to me when I was in the university and recently about eight years ago, when I… when I happened to be in my hometown and after a very long time, one of my English teachers came up to me and said, now I understand why you would not let me teach Robert Frost. I said, ma'am, why would I not let you teach Robert Frost? I like Robert Frost. She said, don't you remember you didn't let me teach Frost? Then I remembered. She came one day, till then we were reading only English poets. She came and introduced the American poet and she said, Robert Frost, such a great man. And then she started off, woods are lovely, dark and deep. I said, stop. I said, a man who calls a tree a wood, I don't want to listen to this guy. She <laughs> she said, no, no, this is a very great poet. I said, I don't care how great he is, he calls tree a wood. I don't want to listen to him. <laughs> then when we wanted to start this process in southern India, when we found that rivers were going dry and the groundwater was sinking very rapidly, when I decided we will plant hundred and fourteen million trees in Tamil Nadu, the simple thing that we did was, I took thousands of people, made them sit in the trees and we set up a yogic process with which they experienced that what they are breathing out, the trees are inhaling. What the trees are exhaling, they are inhaling. And they realized one half of their lungs is hanging out there. Once they realized this, there is no stopping. Even today, millions of trees are being planted on a yearly basis, all done by common people, simply because we brought this yogic experience to them, that they truly realized that one half of their breathing apparatus is actually out there, not here. So, bringing this experience into people, that what you think as myself is not within the boundaries of your physical nature, it goes well beyond that. If this becomes a living reality, then fulfilling these goals that United Nations has for the world is… becomes much more possible than the way it is right now, where we are trying to push in one way, but a whole lot of people are pushing in the opposite direction because they don't even see it as theirs. Thank you, Sadhguru. I, I wanted to uh, point out this incredible thing about the tree planting project is that Sadhguru insisted that the trees be planted on small plots of land, less than half an acre, and half of the trees are fruit trees, and then half of them can be used for firewood, so that the people who live on these lands are benefited from them, they take care of the trees, and those trees actually really grow. And um, one of the things that that's really working on is, uh, is poverty. And when I look at the world today, and I see, especially in the United States, this incredible gap between people who have capital and people who don't. And uh, it's, a, it's a very disturbing sign to me, um, that this, the gap between rich and poor. 
Can you talk a little bit about how yoga would address that in terms of sustainable development? So we must understand this, that we have chosen econo an economic model which is all about everybody for himself or herself. There is no larger commitment to humanity as such because that is market economy. Everybody does according to their own capabilities and skills and grab what they can grab. It's literally a uh, shoot and scoot economy. But we have gone for this simply because the socialistic, communistic ideas have unfortunately failed, not necessarily because they're bad, because human beings are not ready for it yet. That is, poor people who had nothing wanted to share, the rich never wanted to share. So it became a joke in the world. If the rich had to… if rich had the consciousness to share, communism would have been a great idea, but the poor want to share, rich don't want to share. So that is the same situation here and this is the same situation building up everywhere else in the world. Is this the best way to run the world? No. But do we have a better idea? No. So <laughs> because right now we are in that place. So the only thing that we can truly do is that we bring what is this, what we are referring to as yoga, as a living experience. Yoga does not mean twisting your body, yoga does not mean standing on your head, yoga does not mean holding your breath. Yoga means in some way you have transcended the limitations of your physical nature. You are beginning to experience life as a larger possibility, not just this physical form that you are. Once this becomes a living experience, Sharing and living together will become a, a common experience everywhere. Does it mean we are going to start communes and everybody will live together? No, we can run businesses in a more inclusive way. We can create a more inclusive economic model. And this need not be done by government policy. This can be done by private individuals because there are companies which are almost as large as nations today. There are companies which budgets which are bigger than nations. So it is very much possible that business can be run in a more inclusive way. Right now we are thinking only of profit. Our idea of profit is very short-term kind of idea. If you really want to run your company, if you are thinking in terms of your company prospering in the next hundred, two hundred, five hundred years continuously, then it's very important that you make your customer your partner, that you make everybody else in the society your partner, whatever you're manufacturing or whatever you're selling or whatever the business sees, whether you're selling a safety pin or a computer or a spacecraft, essentially the business is about human well-being. If this is… this comes into the consciousness of every business person, if this comes into the consciousness of building every business, that essentially this is about human well-being. We do it in so many ways, but fundamentally it's about that. If this awareness and consciousness is instilled in the businesses on the planet, then you can find the capitalistic way of living need not mean disparity, can mean well-being to everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> Sadhguru, I, I read the other day that um, that for every dollar in government investment um, that, uh, in developing countries, that there's seven dollars now in private investment. So. How do we use yoga to yoke in the, uh, the private corporations that are looking just at their bottom line um, to, to uh, end up really having development that's fair and just? In the last twenty years, uh, I have largely focused on the business leaders because there was a time a few hundred years ago where the most influential leadership on the planet was religious leadership. Later on, when the military machines built up in a big way, the military leaders dominated the world. In the last hundred years, democratically elected leaders have become the most dominant force. In the next fifteen to twenty-five years, you will see the business leaders will be the most important or influential leadership on the planet. The good thing about business is that a businessman is willing to make a deal if the deal is good no matter who you are. I'm saying the old prejudice of I cannot make a deal with somebody is going away and they're willing to make a deal. 
Now, anything is sustainable only if it is beneficial to both the parties. Nothing can be sustained either in the marketplace or in marriage unless it's beneficial to both the parties. Only when it's truly beneficial to both the parties, this can be sustained. This is slowly sinking into the business leadership. I have seen in the last twenty years, prominent business leaders, their way of thinking is very, very different than what it was. My essential work has been to move individual leaders from their personal ambitions to a larger vision, because a larger vision means then the business is sustainable for a long period of time. If it's just your personal ambition, the world will work against you. If you have a larger vision, the world will work with you. This is a big difference. So this is something that is slowly sinking in. You will see if you see annual meetings of uh, major businesses, what they're talking, if you look at the economic forum, if you look at various economic, uh, you know, assemblies on the planet, you will see they're all beginning to talk about a larger vision, how to make a difference rather than how to make a profit. This has become the language of the business these days. It still has to manifest in a big way, but at least the language has changed from profit to making a difference. Thank you. Sadhguru, the… Um, <clears throat> when you look at societies all across the world, there, there's a huge gap between what's available to women and what's available to men. The Sustainable Development Goals address this. How… Uh, what's the role of gender equality in yoga? See, yoga means uh, transcending your physical nature on one level. If you transcend your physical nature, where is the question of being a male or a female? You being a male or a female is relevant only in a few spaces in your life in bathrooms and bedrooms. Rest of the places, I don't see why you should recognize somebody as a man or a woman. Why are we identifying people with reproductory organs? If you must use a body part, at least use the brain <laughs> I think a small gender difference that is there between us to fulfill a certain aspect of our life is being stretched too far. I think this is from another period where it was not possible for a woman to participate because of variety of physical situations in the world. And that is largely leveled today in most parts of the world and it's rapidly changing everywhere, I would say. Uh, I think a more active effort is needed, at least by law in most nations, it is hundred percent equal. By practice, there is still discrepancies which has to be worked at. I feel it's a generational thing. Once the older generation moves out, the younger generation is not looking at it that way anymore. At least I see that in all the Asian countries, it is only people beyond sixty years of age who think on… in this mode. The younger people are not thinking that way anymore. Thank you. So, Guru, I'm just going to ask you one more question because I, I want to save time for the audience um, who've been uh, waiting to talk to you. And um, I, can you talk, tell about how you conceive the world in thirty years? What I see is uh, for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, human intellect is sparking like never before. More people on the planet today can think for themselves than ever before in the history of this human existence. So once human intellect begins to spark like this, unless something is logically correct and scientifically verifiable, it will fail in future. You may be willing to listen to a few things, but your children are not going to listen to anything that does not make sense to them. It does not matter from what authority it comes from. Or in other words, we are moving into an era where Authority cannot be the truth. Truth will be the only authority in future. We are getting there because everybody is beginning to ask questions and people are not afraid to ask questions anymore, so this is bound to happen. Once this happens, human 
aspiration for well-being has to have a logically correct and scientifically ascertainable methodology and it's of tremendous importance that today the International Yoga Day has been declared in the last uh, one year. It was mooted by the Prime Minister, but it was almost like the world was waiting for it, as they mentioned, 177 countries never before. In the history of United Nations, all of them agreed upon one thing as they agreed upon yoga. It looked like they were waiting for it. Yes, the world has been waiting for a scientific and a logically correct solution for human well-being. The aspiration for human well-being will not stop. Unless we provide a proper scientifically structured methodology, then people in terms of well-being will move towards chemicals. This is a deep, a grave concern in the world. The number of people moving towards alcohol and drugs in the last twenty-five years must be maybe five hundred to thousand percent more than what it was twenty-five years ago. This is mainly because in pursuit of human well-being, there are no logically correct answers to their questions. That is the reason why human beings are seeking these kind of solutions. Unless we provide this, this is a natural progression. I see in the next thirty years to fifty years, there will be a big movement towards a scientific process for inner well-being. And this is the right time to be here at this uh, forum and this yoga becoming a worldwide thing. We must understand yoga is not an Indian thing. If you want to call yoga Indian, then you must call gravity European, okay <laughs> Because Yes, it… Uh, it originated from that place because India is one place where for a few millennia we had uninterrupted time to look deep inwards and to look at the human mechanism in utmost profoundness as to how this functions, what is the ultimate possibility within this human mechanism. This has taken a few millennia to understand and arrive at this possibility and yoga I want this message to go, the science of yoga is not just about health, it's not just about fitness, it is an ultimate solution for every aspect of human existence. There is different types of yogas, yoga can be taught in different di dimensions. The ultimate possibility of raising beyond our physical nature, the ultimate possibility of knowing life in its fullest way, the word yoga means union. The word yogi means one who has experienced this union. We need not one, two, five yogis, we need millions of them who have a sense of union with the rest of the universe, particularly those who hold responsible positions in the world. They must come to this experience because leadership essentially means you have the privilege of touching other people's lives. What you think, what you feel and what you do, every single thought, emotion and action either makes or breaks people's lives. That's what leadership means. When you are given such a privilege, it's very, very important that you are in a state of yoga, that you experience life around you as yourself. If we… if any of us feel the work that we are doing is important, the first and foremost thing is we must work upon ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadhguruji, for those words of wisdom. And thank you, Max, for joining us here. We really thank appreciate you for your presence. Thank you for organizing the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Max. We will switch gears now. Sadhguruji, we will request you to keep seating. Uh, we will request uh, Ms. Tao Porshma Lynch to again.